hello everyone and welcome to this month's um, Wing UK presentation. Um, thanks for joining us, there's plenty of you turning up, that's perfect, it's great. Just a few little bits of housekeeping as usual. Um, so for those of you that are not familiar with our presentations, um, we can record them and then we can share them via our social media pages in the next week or so. Um, so it would be really great, I see most of you have done it anyway, but if you could keep your microphones turned off so we can avoid any um, sort of background noise and interference on the recording, any distractions and things like that. Um, and there will be some time for Q&As at the end of the talk. So today we have um, Nadia Narian from uh, the University of Durham. Uh, Nadia is uh, a good friend of mine and a fellow graduate from the University of Plymouth graduating in 2014 with the Integrated Masters in Geology. Um, she went on to start her PhD at Durham University in association with Durham Energy Institute in the same year. She has done some consulting on uh, a range of geothermal projects in the Northeast, including the geothermal potential of the Upper Carboniferous at East Close Farm. Um, and she's really passionate about finding ways to reduce the global carbon footprint moving towards a low carbon economy and driving change without impacting our quality of life or the environment we live in. So if everyone else can make sure their microphones are switched off and I'll just turn mine off as well. And it's over to you, Nadia. Thanks ever so much. Thank you very much and thank you for inviting me. Um, so yeah, so I'm Nadia, so I'm going to be talking to you about uh, my research into the cast in the uh, deep carboniferous limestone in um, Great Britain. So, so this slide is black for a reason, nobody panic. Um, so I'm gonna take you back in time, first of all, um, and I want you to kind of imagine that it's um, the end of 1973 and we're going into 1974. So it's midnight, we're counting down, it's five, four, three, two, one, happy new year. Or is it? The lights have gone out in Great Britain. The OPEC Arab oil states have imposed an oil embargo. A coal miner strike is imminent. Today, energy shortages are enfor have enforced a three day work week. Commercial consumption of electricity has been limited to three days in an effort to convert conserve energy. The world has been hit by an economic crisis, and Britain has taken a particularly hard hit. You don't know it yet, but in 1979, there's gonna be another oil crisis. This decade is about to cause a pivotal shift in the global energy paradigm. So after plunging into darkness, the UK has been shaken by a breach in energy security. The realization has dawned that these measures must, that measures must be taken to tighten the security of the supplies to meet future demand. We begin to invest heavily in alternative cleaner energies, launching a renewable energy program in 1974. Investment remains heavy in the nuclear sector, but new research and development programs are launched in sectors such as wind, wave, and geothermal. It's 1974, and we are fluctuating around uh, investment of 700 million pounds into um, energy and research into these new programs. By, by 1984, um, there's a nationwide geothermal assessment commissioned by the European Commission, the Department of Energy at the time in the UK. Um, this assessment is the first of its kind and it establishes several geothermal resources in Mesozoic sedimentary basins in the UK. So that middle um, map there shows where they establish those resources in those basins. Um, and we also found resources in radiothermal granites um, in the southwest um, and also up north uh, by Weirdale um, and near the lake, in the Lake District. Um, the map on the right shows the heat flow um, across the UK and you can see that the high heat flows coincide with the um, where we've got the granites there. Um, so as a result of that geothermal assessment, um, we ended up with 
the first and only deep working deep geothermal uh, well in Southampton. Um, not many people know about it. Um, so everyone's kind of surprised when you tell them, yeah, we've got we've had geothermal energy in the UK for quite a long time. Um, and that encountered waters, I think it was something like around 76, 78 degrees. And that was part of that general geothermal assessment that occurred in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, and they drilled a few wells in Southampton and then eventually nothing really became of them during that time. And it wasn't until many years later um, when there was an accountant by the name of um, Mike Smith um, who thought actually there's some potential there. All we need is funding to develop it. Um, and I guess conferences are useful for something because, he's, because he ended up um, finding his funding at a conference um, to then go on to develop a district heating scheme in Southampton. So now this district heating scheme um, provides um, heating for the local council offices, the local swimming pool and various other buildings been slowly growing. Um, so there is potential in the UK. Um, And then by the end of the geothermal assessment, we did start to see a decline in research and development investment. So you can see it's kind of quite a bit of a, a bit of a drop there. By 1994, the entire geothermal program had ended um, and fossil fuels were seen as the cheaper option. Um, our focus on wind and wave power pushed the pursuit of geothermal energy to the side. Um, and it wasn't really until 20 years later that we then had these other two reports that then were generating in new interest in uh, geothermal energy in the UK. So, um, yeah, so by the 1980s, I, I, we had a, a peak in uh, UK oil production. By 2004, um, we had like a, we had kind of another energy scare, if you will. Um, the fate of our energy security declined again. We became a net energy importer, and today, 80% of our homes are um, heated by gas. And nearly 50% of our energy consumption goes into um, heat. Um, a lot of that goes into space heating. Um, and this, I believe, is kind of a general consensus across Europe. Across Europe, almost 50% of that energy consumption is due, um, goes towards um, heat purposes. And of that 50%, nearly 70% um, is um, of us burning fossil fuels. And of that, 66% is from gas and we do import quite a lot of gas so that's another sort of energy security issue there. So I want you to kind of remember everything I've just um, told you because the history is kind of it really does kind of inform the purpose of my investigation into cast but now I'm going to switch gears a bit and we're going to have a look at cast. So what is CAST? So I'll go into this with those who um, don't know. So wanting to, so firstly, CAST tends to form in carbonates, um, predominantly limestone and dolomite. Um, it can occur in evaporites too. It's a solutional process that takes place, um, which involves the interaction of CO2 and water to form this weak carbonic acid that then um, exploits the weaknesses in rocks such as jointing and open fractures. This creates a variety of geometries. Um, cast is very, very heterogeneous. Um, that's kind of one of the big problems with cast. Um, the source of CO2 can be atmospheric, but more likely most of the CO2 is sourced from um, the soil and um, via root respiration. Um, sulfuric acid is another um, type of acid that can cause dissolution. You can get things like um, oxidized pyrite ca causing that. 
Um, in the diagram, that limestone block there is um, confined by an aquitard above and below to confine, confine the flow. And it just gives you an example of the kinds of features we find, um, at least at the surface, um, like sinkholes and springs and caves. Um, and although I put that we get casts associated with tropical and humid climates, they can occur in temperate climates as well. Um, we've got evidence of glacial cast from the Quaternary in the UK. Um, water in cooler climates has the capacity to carry more CO2, um, but in more tropical and humid climates, you're producing more CO2, um, and you, you've also got that um, water to recharge the aquifer. Um, it's interesting that we actually find a higher proportion of cast in temperate, cold and arid, region, arid regions today. Um, and all that, that may be the case, it could be remnants of earlier phases of castification. There's definitely the theory that um, because you are producing more CO2 in tropical areas that you get more dissolution in those areas. So things tend to happen at more rapid rates and it will dissolve away at more rapid rates and therefore there's a misrepresentation of um, sort of tropical cast. Um, and then the kind of more obvious one is it's nature and ge geology being um, quite biased. So where have, you, where have you got the geology for forecast to form? So limestone, um, if it happens to be in that climate, that's, that's just kind of where it's going to form. And the fact that um, it's a, a sub aerial feature um, is quite important to my study. So why do we care about cast? So generally, cast is important for things like geohazards. Um, I'm going to, if you haven't seen this video, I'm going to show you a, a short video just to show you why they're important for um, geohazards. See if it works. Three, four. Don't want all in. Oh, So that's a sinkhole in Louisiana. Um, we also care about cast from a perspective of um, it's a freshwater resource. Um, that's just a picture of my field work. I was trying to look for a picture of a, a spring. There is a spring there flowing into a bucket. Um, the common uh, percentage that's cited for the percent of the global population that's dependent on, on freshwater resources is usually 25 percent but there's a new statistic that's come that's come out um 9.8 percent of the population are uh, dependent on cast for their freshwater resources uh, it seems a bit more of a robust figure they've used um sort of quite a detailed uh, global database Um, and obviously, cast is important in the oil and gas industry. So 50 to 60 percent of the world's oil reserves are found in carbon. It's whether that be in castified, fractured or both um, um, carbonates. Um, obviously, the, the positives are that they do produce high porosity and permeability, or they're certainly capable um, of producing that. Um, but there are a lot of cons and it's ironic that the cons um for the oil industry um and drilling are the very things that would help you identify cast in the well records so things like um significant drill bit drops significant loss of fluids um uh, heterogeneity i wish i wish they were homogenous um loss of structure if if you're pursuing um an overbearing 
reservoir and you've got cast underneath um, if that collapses underneath your entire play is just um, really quite messed up and you have to go back to the drawing board about what to do about that um, so where do we uh, sort of find cast in the UK um, so this is just a general map of some of the carbonate aquifers that we have in the UK so in the southeast um, we've got Cretaceous chalk in green, and then we move on to um, Jurassic limestones in yellow. We've got um, orange and black Triassic salts and gypsum. We've got um, some of that um, blue Paleozoic limestone, and that's kind of where I'm I'm focused on because a lot of that is Carboniferous limestone. Um, and why am I focusing on Carboniferous limestone? So if we just sort of rewind a bit, um, why am I focusing on the Paleozoic at all? Um, well, we went through that oil crisis. We then had that national geothermal assessment. And then um, we, we did establish geothermal targets in the Mesozoic, um, but we didn't really go any, any deeper than the Mesozoic. Um, and we certainly know um, that Carboniferous Limestone has potential um, for being a cast aquifer at depth. And I'll go on to speak about why. Um, but this was an interesting um, excerpt from the uh, geothermal resource assessment that was done in the 1970s and 80s, which says, because of the uncertain knowledge about the detailed nature of the upper Paleozoic rocks at depth, the geothermal resources have not been estimated at this stage. Nevertheless, it would be unwise and incorrect to dismiss them as having no potential for. Although a significant resource has not been specifically identified, the possibility remains that resources exist in several regions. So even during that report, they said that it shouldn't really be dismissed. But now that we're several decades later, we have um, We've gained more data, we've got more technology, and we can um, start looking into these um, resources that are um, in the Upper Paleozoic. So this is um, the, just the general geology of the UK, if you're not familiar with it. Um, in particular, uh, just pay attention to the, the fact that we've got this block and basin topography, um, and it's those sort of blocks um, in blue there. Um, that are quite significant for areas where we're developing cast. Um, that block and basin topography was formed during the early Carboniferous. Um, so, yeah. And then another reason why I'm looking at Carboniferous limestones is because we know that um, most of the thermal or tepid springs in the UK come from Carboniferous limestones. Um, so if you're not familiar with the UK, in, in the UK, in the southwest, our hottest spring is at Bath Spa, and that's around 45 degrees Celsius, going up to maybe 47 degrees Celsius, um, and that's in the Carboniferous limestones. And then in South Wales, we've got Taft's Well, 18.6 to 21.6 degrees Celsius. Um, and then at Buxton, we've got 27 to 28 degrees Celsius. Harrogate, we've got limestones, but we've also got sandstones as well in there that the water is flowing through. That's 14 degrees, 14 degrees Celsius. So they're not the hottest springs in the world, but they are pretty warm springs and they're all coming from the Carboniferous limestone. In addition to that, um, in that map where I, where I did show you where we do have these um, carbonate aquifers, a lot of the we do get some cast in other um, in other lithologies in the Jurassic and and some in the chalk, um, but there's nothing that's more extensive than what you find in the Carboniferous limestones in terms of we've got extensive cave development um, and it's the they're very um, interconnected, quite interconnected caves and quite large as well. And um, so if we if if that unit has the potential to form that um, um, amount of um, porosity and permeability, and we're seeing that just at the surface, what are we going to find at depth? Um, there must be some potential there. 
Um, so during my research, I make use of um, some 2D data, that, seismic data that I have access to. I do this because um, I'm looking at the Carboniferous limestone unconformity because on a regional scale, I'm looking for any aerial exposure that we've had um, that could have then be opportunities for castification. I also do a um, little bit of geochemistry work and looking at the um, the um, reservoir temperatures and by um, sampling spring waters or really going through some of the literature for some of this data. I also look at well records, I look at core, um, any, anything that I can get my hands on. And then the aim is to kind of integrate all of this together to then produce a, a play fairway map analysis of the resource. So geothermal, geothermometry analysis of springs. So I have um, collated data across the UK. I've looked at springs. I think that's probably the first step in a um, in a geothermal, in an, in, when you're doing a nationwide geothermal investigation is looking at just what you have at the surface first. Do you have any warm springs? Even if you have some cold springs, you can sample those. The, temp the temperatures at the surface don't necessarily reflect what you've got at depth because you do get mixing. Um, so by geothermometry analysis, what I've done is there's two types of, broadly speaking, geothermometry. Um, analysis. So there's kind of the more traditional um, using cation geothermometers um, and plugging your numbers in and um, getting a, a trying to get a decent temperature. And then there's kind of more recently the multi-component geothermometry analysis that's uh, becoming more and more popular. Um, and I will discuss those shortly. Um, so just taking a look at Bath as an example. Um, so if you've ever been to Bath, it's quite an extraordinary place. Um, and what, as I said, the water is there, approximately 45 degrees Celsius. Um, I've looked at just to keep it simple. I've there's I've looked at three different water sources at Bath, and um, Bath has pretty much been studied to a T. So this is, uh, this is just an example. Um, so I've looked at King Spring. King Spring is the main spring. Um, Stool Street borehole, that's uh, the borehole that was drilled. Um, cross bath. And then like you'll see that there's quite a range of temperatures and those temperatures have been taken from those empirical calculations that are usually done. Um, when you're trying to find that reservoir temperature. Um, and there's various ratios, there's um, potassium, magnesium, there's sodium, um, potassium. Um, and the really important thing to note, I think, is that um, the sodium-potassium ratios are um, quite unreliable when you have uh, low temperature waters. So they can kind of be immediately um, eliminated, they're known for not being um, very reliable um, unless you are working in a high temperature environment. Um, I put there that there's a roughly uh, 60 degree Celsius reservoir temperature for those 45 degree Celsius springs. Um, and that's being corroborated. I've done a little bit of multi-component geothermometry analysis. I think there's plenty of work to be done on that. Um, but I've used that against um, these geothermometers to then um, try and derive and narrow down my temperatures. Um, and multi-component geothermometry um, makes, use of, makes use of the saturation indices. Um, and tends to be a little bit more uh, robust. And then um, in Wales, I've these are all springs. Um, I've done the same thing. 
Um, and the crosses on the graph are they're quite small crosses, so I don't know if you can see them, but they are the temperatures of the springs at the surface. Um, so anything below that is tends to be questionable. So there's temperatures that have been calculated that are less than the temperature that you're getting at the surface. So they're immediately uh, questionable, especially if you're getting like negative temperatures. Um, and again, that band there, it's quite, it's still quite a wide ranging band, but it's a rough band in red. Um, that's also been uh, corroborated with multi-component geothermometry analysis, but again, more needs to be done on that front. Um, and those kinds of temperatures tend to be between 20 and 40 degrees Celsius for spring waters in Wales. And they're spring waters that have been taken from, um, Kind of mostly north and south Wales um, and some in, uh, some in mid Wales as well. So what is the point of these temperatures that I mean if you if you weren't used to working in a low temperature geothermal environment you'd think that they're quite measly <laughs> temperatures um, but what can you use these temperatures for? So 50% of um, of the greenhouse gas emissions due to heat come from the domestic sector, 30% come from industry, and 20% come from the commercial sector. And again, a lot of that heating it goes into space heating. It's something like 70 plus percent goes towards space heating in the UK. So why not use some of these temperatures um, for underfloor heating? Um, you can certainly boost temperatures with heat pumps, um, but it will be very, it would still be um, something worth pursuing. So now let's dive deeper. Um, and I'm just going to briefly go through what I've been doing, which is following the Carboniferous Limestone on Conformity across the UK. So much of my data, actually pretty much all of my data, comes from the UK Onshore Geophysical Library. They are um, an organization in the UK that holds all of the um, all of the data um, and a high density of there's a high density of well data in the East Midlands so I've mostly done a lot of focus in the East Midlands um, with interpreting the seismic and with interpreting the well in, in, in relation to interpreting the wells as well um, finding where we have casts in the wells and then yeah trying to um, deduce the resource there and but I have also interpreted other areas across the Midlands um, and going south as well. So just to sh sort of show you the quality of my data because it is 2D data it is onshore data it can be a bit noisy sometimes in places and the deeper you go it's just it's not uh, it's not um, the most, uh, the best quality of data, um, but it does it does help. And in some areas, you do have um, pretty good quality. Um, so this is just an example in the East Midlands of um, some of that seismic data. Um, in in the Welton field, we have found um, that there is um, some evidence of water flowing there in the Carboniferous limestone. Um, so it's very worth interpreting that. And then this is just another one, um, the Hanbury well. Um, the colors are slightly mismatched on this. So if we just focus on the drawn diagram on the right, um, where the blue is the top of the Carboniferous limestone. And then the yellow um, is the uh, mid Numerian unconformity and then the pink is the unconformity in the Numerian. I think this goes to show that there are that there are several unconformities occurring in the region, and they are plenty of they provide plenty of opportunities for cast to occur. So that's what I'm doing. I'm looking at all the different unconformities and all the different opportunities where we would have had aerial exposure, and then we would have possibly had um, a chance for castification to occur. And this just kind of goes to um, reflect that that we've had several um there's several opportunities in the carboniferous 
in the Jurassic, going into the Cretaceous, um, in the Permian, in the Permian-Triassic, um, there are plenty of opportunities for um, waters to have exploited uh, carboniferous limestone weaknesses and to produce this cast. Um, from core, so Grove 3 is a well in the East Midlands, and that's um, shown some very buggy porosity. So this is just showing you the different, how, heter how um, much heterogeneity there is in these limestones. So this um, is buggy porosity. This is found from um, a depth of over two kilometers. Um, and then Humbly Grove, Humbly Grove, where we've got Triassic on top of uh, Carboniferous Limestone. We've got these um, fractures running through, quite sizable fractures. Um, and even though they, uh, if they're not, so ne not necessarily where you drill, they'll be, so if you drill and you find that they're, they're in that particular core, they're, they're closed, they're not necessarily closed all the way through the unit. Um, so that's important. And then also you get these brecciated types of cast, um, which could be a sort of a cave, cave collapse, um, and then they've been infilled. And then um, just to kind of relate that a little bit back to the springs and I mean, no matter where you go, like the deeper you go into the earth, like the temperatures are going to get hotter and, and hotter. Um, and but the real thing that you kind of you're looking out for is the the flow rates um, that you're encountering. And so the blue are the um, spring water flow rates um, that I've recorded, um, either uh, from the literature or, or elsewhere. Um, and they're quite they're quite sizable spring rates. So the ones on the on the left of the red, um, most of these, apart from the King's the King Spring, which is in Bath, are from um, the Derbyshire area. And then we've got Taft's Well, and the and the x-axis. See the x-axis. Sorry, is um, is the name of the spring. And then the y-axis would be uh, the flow rate in yeah, cubic meters per day. And then the red shows the different um, wells where we've encountered water. So we saw growth three, um, and we've got growth three on here um, with about 50 cubic meters per day. But then we've got um, a well, Strelly, um, which has produced um, quite a lot. It's, it seems to be nearly 500 meters cubed per day. Um, so it's quite a lot of um, water when you compare it to also the flow rates of the spring. So, so we so we are seeing sort of the same thing that we see at the surface um, at depth. So we're seeing evidence of high porosity and high permeability. And then this is a bit blurry, but um, this is just reflecting um, the fact that kind of either side. So, um, OK, so this is going across from the UK. And if you see the outline of the UK, because these graphs can be quite difficult to, to look at with all the information on. We've got the outline of the UK and it's going across um, into sort of what is that? Like, um, so the rest of Europe and we've got the Netherlands up there. Um, that's showing the uh, cast areas that are on the shelf, the shelf and the platform or areas that are going off the uh, London Brabant Massif. Um, and there are plenty of opportunities to cast, um, especially in the um, East Midlands where we've got different wells like Milton Green, Nettleham, um, we're finding a lot of we are finding water in those wells, um, and that goes all the way across the channel. Um, so that must be quite a significant unit to research. That's another um, reason why I have been researching this unit.
And the overall aim will be to have a play fairway um, map. This is kind of just a, a, pl a preliminary map, um, which shows in solid blue, you've got the carbon limestone at depth, um, that's been interpreted by the BGS. And then those striped blue areas are the areas where I'm, I'm saying where you have um, those areas also have carboniferous, carboniferous limestone at depth, and they're also worth um, looking at um, as well. And you can see the different uh, spring waters um, in relation to those carboniferous limestone, um, carboniferous limestone, um, and that just goes to show again that a lot of the tepid springs are associated with that unit. Um, so overall, um, carboniferous limestone does have the potential to, for secondary porosity and permeability. Um, it hosts many of the thermal springs in Britain um, and certainly some of the longest and largest cave systems. So it does have potential to provide deep circulation. Um, it has the potential to host high flow rates. We see that at spring waters on the surface and we also see that um, at depth in the wells. Um, the main application of this resource could be used to reduce our energy consumption of heat and to, to improve energy security and reduce fuel poverty as well, perhaps. Um, an evaluation of such resources not occurred in the UK before. So this is kind of like the first time that we're, that we're actually exploring deeper on this scale, on this regional scale as well. Um, so yes, yeah, so once I have integrated all my information together, because I've got all the different pieces of information, I'll integrate that all together and I will have a final assessment of the resource in all these um, areas in the UK. So thank you for listening. Thanks ever so much, Nadia. That was a really interesting talk. It's definitely an area of geothermal potential within the UK that I am much less familiar with, and I'm guessing some of our uh, guests today would be in a similar position. Um, I noticed one or two of our guests today were jumping in and out. If that was down to your Wi-Fi reception, don't worry. Uh, we are recording this, so it will be available for you to listen back to if you had any issues. So moving on from that now, does anybody have any questions? If you want to turn on microphones and or videos and ask Nadia some questions, feel free. This usually takes a minute before people become confident. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi, was that me? Yes, Pete, go ahead. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Nadia. That was very interesting. Uh, and obviously an awful lot of work. I'm, I missed, I may have missed at the beginning, is this part of a PhD or a different research project you're doing? Yeah, it's part of the PhD. So I'm, I'm due to submit my PhD soon. So I'm now collating everything together, everything okay. that I've done. It's a lot of, there's been a lot of disparate and uh, different pieces of data to integrate to depth together. So yeah, that's How long part. Have you got to go? Oh, I'm submitting very soon this year. Okay, right, cool. Well, I wish you well with that. I think it's a Thank lovely piece of work. Can I ask you a question? In your slide about tracking the carb lime unconformity, you had green dots and red dots on there. Was there any significance to that? Or were those dots just the places where you got data from, or were they different types of data? Which? Can you get that one? Or are they not red dots? What are they? I can no, see green. This and is red the seismic dots. data. So the green data. Um, okay. So so this is actually the seismic data. This is that's sort of the density of the seismic data that the UK onshore geophysical library holds. Um, okay. The green would be from um, from like industry, um, and then the co and then the coal authority data would be the ones in red. Right. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. And then they've done some regional lines as well, which were in purple. Um, and they're all available, but you can go on their website and you can look at all these data because they've got the images up on, on their website. Yeah. So they're all freely available to just to, to look at. Okay, cool. Am I allowed to one, ask one more, Helen? Sorry. Of course you can. <laughs> uh, the, I liked your correlation of uh, the sorts of flow rates uh, and the potential locations of castification. 
Do you have any kind of feel for the sort of average depths or the depth range where mm. there might be good castified formations that could be uh, accessed by drilling? Any idea about that distribution? Yeah, well, um, it's a good question. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Probably not off the top of my head. I've probably got it written down somewhere. Um, okay. But um, because, I mean, we've already got, I mean, a lot of the data that I've looked at has been like from oil and gas wells. So it could just be repurposing the oil and gas wells into geothermal wells. I think that would be very good. And um, I'm trying to think of the depths. Um, I can't think of the top of the head of my head. So sorry. I just wondered if you had a feel for it. Thank you. Anybody else with questions there? Yeah, sure. And um, I don't know your first name. Sorry. No, R -S -S oh, sorry. I have just no, the way okay. the system uh, started up automatically. Uh, Nadia, thank you very much. Very interesting field. Uh, in, in geothermal, the power output, of course, is everything about mass flow times temperature. Uh, when you say high mass flow in your springs, you're, you're looking at like 500, maybe 1,000 cubic meters per day. When we yeah. multiply that with the temperature, those springs and if that translates to depth are very low numbers what evidence is there that we'll get you'll be able to get decent flow rates that are usable in like you know a, a district heating system or, or something uh, at scale over this entire play that you can tab into i mean i've, I've got an extensive history in drilling carbonate so i know how a it's hidden this exactly. and either you get a gusher that might wash out after two days and ends up being you know a very low producer so yeah. that would be a huge risk in, in this so but what indication have you had have of sustainable flow rate that you actually predict in this sort of That's play? That's a really good question I might have to pick your brains um yeah that is a very good question because flow rate is everything um yeah I'm not sure to be honest um I will have to kind of go back to my data and See what I've got in terms of pulling it all together. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I think I'm going to have to get back to you on that on that one. Come back to me. I've got some ideas how you can play with that by combining some things. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We'll put. Um, I'll get um, Claire um, to put you guys directly in touch sort of with emails or something like that, um, and then you can discuss away from here if that's easier for you. But sure. The, most of those flow rates that you quoted, if they're from springs, are natural flow rates. So, you know, you stick a pump in a hole nearby and you can do much better than that if you need to. Yeah. So Only if you've got primary permeability. Sure. But that's that's an issue of if you're going to have to drill boreholes anyway. And you're talking about the stability issues, too. If you're prepared to drill small boreholes and put slotted liners in there or perforated liners in there, that's, you know, it's still a good a good opportunity. Yeah, yeah, certainly. I'll, it's something I'll have to look into a bit more, I think. Um, it's really, I think cast is such a a troublesome thing in geology. Um, it's it's uh, It's been a challenge, certainly, <laughs> this project. Thank you. Anybody else there? Uh, yeah, yeah the job Georgia. Job. Hey, yeah. Nadia, thanks very much. That was interesting. Some of the background stuff. I've been reading those uh, um, older PDF files that you were probably looking at recently as well, just for like a literature review. But anyway, um, have you? I noticed you never. You kept mentioning the UK, but you ignored us in Northern Ireland in your course <laughs> studies. Yeah. Did you look at any of the limestones that are in like the sort of west of Northern Ireland in like the Fermanagh direction or anything like that? I. Didn't I have okay? Probably early on in my project, I did look at a little bit at, at Ireland and Northern Ireland, um, but I haven't done much there because um, there's already a lot going on in terms of looking at the cast potential in Northern Ireland. So I haven't included that um, in my study, um, and I can't remember her name, um, but uh, there was another PhD student and she did a brilliant thesis in the carboniferous limestones in the cast i think she used magnetotellurics um and yeah i think they were finding um 
cast this is the thing that i wanted to look at in my study they were finding cast associated with certain orientations of um bolts and fractures um at the intersection of them so i wanted to look at that in in i don't know if i have time to i probably don't have time to but i wanted to look at that um in in, in britain as well in england um and see if that if we're also finding that there um it's something i probably will want to do um post phd um, and I'll certainly maybe collaborate with Ireland um, and see and see what they've done on, in terms of in terms of that because they seem to be a bit ahead um, in that with respect to that. Yeah, well, if you come across that 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 girl's name that did that one, if yeah. you get a chance or give us a link, that would be great. But no good presentation. Thanks very much. Thank you. Right. Anybody else? Any questions there? Real quiet, yeah. I've just got a, a, a little quick one, actually. Um, do you mention that you found the sodium potassium geothermometers to be sort of pretty unreliable um, with respect to their stability ranges, and it was producing some random numbers? I don't know. Did you mention? I might have missed it. it which of the thermometers you actually found to be the most reliable? Is it literally just the ones that have the data falling within your your red boxes there or and yeah. did you find, did you find that some of the authors say for example um a sodium potassium uh geothermometer by one author completely contradicted the results of a, a sodium potassium geothermometer from a different author did you find that there was a lot of inconsistency there as well i mean they're all a bit they've all been calculated a bit differently um but no generally the sodium potassium ones are really not good for low temperatures the potassium magnesium one was um a pretty a, a pretty good consistent one that kept coming up um um as though it would be um reliable but i've tried not to stick to one because i've been i mean i'm looking at different areas in the uk as well um so what, what might work for one area might not work for another area but um, yeah, potassium, magnesium, and anywhere where I've had lithium data, then the lithium indicators have been quite unreliable, but I don't have that much um, lithium data. Yeah, I found that as well. Is sort of, I've heard that the lithium geothermometers yeah. are supposed to be pretty good, but the lithium data is currently quite limiting, so. Yeah, I think also like, just think just to randomly point out that um a lot of i i really kind of i really went into the geothermometry side of things um during my research and i went through a lot of papers and when you go through some of the papers you start finding inconsistencies um with the way different authors have calculated have have used these geothermometers so they haven't gone back to the original paper, they've taken it from, they've used a program or something and the calculations has actually been wrong. Um, yeah. They're coming up with this and somehow, um, somehow they've um, got that out into the world. But yeah, they, they tend, you have to really be careful with these calculations because if only one wrong number and um, you've got a wrong temperature. So yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate that from the the correlations that I've been doing. I've done like you. I've done a lot of geothermometers. I've had to use sort of geothermometers to determine chloride enthalpy, sort of mixing and all sorts of stuff like that. And yeah. they definitely drive you a little bit mad, and you have to have your wits about you to spot those tiny little nuanced errors and things. So yeah, most yeah. definitely. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thanks ever so much, guys, for joining us today and taking the time out. Again, again thanks, Nadia. It was really interesting. A good look. Finishing Thank up. You. Thank <laughs> you for having me. <laughs> thanks, Nadia. That was really interesting. Thank you, Nadia. Best of luck with everything. Thank you very much.